necessary hands of duty that I mentioned in the doctrine of virtue. One's own perfection and and what about as in themselves? Humans are ends oh, in That's right. And so we can't make other people virtuous. That's about the maxims they adopt. But we can, when we treat them as ends in themselves, sometimes do what? So somebody, when I recognize somebody else, rationally willing an end, I can't make them, well, so, sorry. When I see somebody else, I can't make them adopt one maximum or not another. That's something that they're free to do. Uh, I can't give them an end. So I can't help them promote their perfection. But when they do give themselves an end, and it's a permissible end, what can I do? Help them achieve, help them achieve it. Right. So the happiness of others is a duty and can't course means permissible happiness of others is a duty. So happiness, permissible happiness of others, is something that's a requirement, is a duty for time. What about our own happiness? Uh, he more specifically says if you neglect your own happiness, you're going to tend to neglect your other duty. He does say that, but this is an indirect duty. That's right. It's an indirect duty toward our own happiness. I'm going to read one more passage that says that kind of thing in a minute. But Kant does not think that we have a duty to promote our own happiness. He sort of thinks that this is something that more or less is going to take care of itself. We have a natural desire, natural instinct to satisfy our empirical desires. Our desires present ends to us as good. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not, but they're presented that way, so we're going to have a natural tendency to pursue our own happiness. Therefore, Kant thinks, we don't have a duty to promote our own happiness. It's something that will, again, more or less take care of itself. So, on the one hand, on the one hand, he thinks that our own happiness, permissible happiness, I'll stop saying that, um, our own happiness is good, and other people's happiness is good also. So on the one hand, there's no real contrast uh, in how he, how he treats different people's ends. On the other hand, there kind of is a big difference in how he treats different people's ends. One is a requirement of morality, and the other isn't. Um, and so, I mean, you might think of it this way. Uh, Kant thinks that for uh, us rational animals, us finite rational beings, there's going to be a natural tendency to focus on ourselves and our ends. And what we have to do is fight that off and push toward recognizing other people's permissible ends also. So the fight is, the struggle is, to get us to recognize the value of other people and their ends. And that's what morality is about. That's what virtue is about. The struggle to break out of our self-interested concerns to get us to um, be concerned about promoting others. And so morality is not about, and virtue, is not about pursuing our own ends. That, that, we don't need any help with that. The struggle is to get us to value other people's ends. Um, uh, now, I think what Nietzsche would say about this is that if morality is concerned exclusively with other people's permissible ends, if it's all about struggling to put aside our own interests 
and is focused exclusively on sacrificing our own interests for that of others, there's going to be a tendency to denigrate our own happiness. There's going to be a tendency to denigrate our own empirical drives. Playing up morality in this sense, emphasizing the value of morality, understood in this way, is going to give us a kind of distorted picture about how different ends should be balanced. It's going to, even if this is not Kant's intention, it's going to, as a psychological matter of fact, constantly drilling into people's heads that your duty is to sacrifice yourself for others, the result of that is going to be self-denial and self-hatred. It's going to be a tendency to think that your own desires, your own inclinations are evil, are immoral, are things that you should simply uh, fight against and hate, uh, along with all of our natural instincts and our natural drives, our empirical desires, and our physical bodies. Um, so we're going to come to <coughs> hate our empirical existence. Um, and even if this is maybe not the maybe not Kant's intention, uh, this is going to be the upshot, this is going to be the result of this understanding of morality. And you can actually see traces of this attitude even in Kant. So, in the groundwork. This is on page 40 at 428. He's, he's talking about uh, persons as ends in themselves, as opposed to the satisfaction of desires and inclinations. He says, all objects of inclinations have a conditional worth only. For if the inclinations and the needs founded on them did not exist, their object would be without worth. It's only because we desire certain things that those ends are taken to be good. But the inclinations themselves, the empirical desires that present certain ends as good, but the inclinations themselves, as sources of need, are so far from having an absolute worth, that is, the desires themselves are not intrinsically good, so as to make one wish for them as such, that to be entirely free from them, to be entirely free from our empirical desires, must rather be the universal wish of every rational being. So here's Kant maybe getting a little carried away with this idea that our empirical desires what, make us impure. It would be the rational wish of every rational being to eliminate our empirical existence, to eliminate our empirical desires to be completely free from them. So this is the kind of implication of understanding morality as self-denial that you just picked up on. Um, one, more, one more passage I want to read. Um, from the Metaphysics of Morals. Um, and this is uh, um, right before the um, passage I read before. So this is section um, 29 of the Doctrine of Virtue, this is on 201. He says this, so this is really in pretty sharp contrast to the passage that I just read, um, where there the emphasis is on trying to eliminate the influence of our empirical desires because they're not pure. 
here, Kant shows a much greater appreciation of the fact that we are embodied rational beings. Section 29 says, providing for oneself to the extent necessary just to find satisfaction in living belongs among duties to oneself. The contrary of this is depriving oneself slavishly of what is essential to the cheerful enjoyment of life by avarice, or depriving oneself fanatically of enjoyment of the pleasures of life by, exaggerating, by exaggerated discipline of one's natural inclinations. Both of these are opposed to the human being's duty to, him, to himself. Um, so, actually one more passage related to this. Um, So, uh, so sorry. So there, uh, it's crucial that we uh, satisfy our empirical desires to the extent that's necessary in order for us to um, be able to act virtuously. Here, uh, toward the end, um, section fifty-three then of the doctrine of virtue says the rules for practicing virtue aim at a frame of mind that is both valiant and cheerful in fulfilling its duties. For virtue not only has to muster all forces to overcome the obstacles it must contend with, so for sure there's a struggle there, but it also, involves it, it also involves sacrificing many of the joys of life, the loss of which can sometimes make one's mind gloomy and sullen. But what is not done with pleasure, but merely as compulsion, as compulsory service, has no inner worth for one who attends to duty this way, and such service is not loved by him. Instead, he shirks as much as possible occasions for practicing virtue. So, we have to become, we have to act virtuously and from duty with a cheerful mind, happy that we are uh, acting in a virtuous way. He says, Monkish, monkish ascetics, so the self-denial associated with monks, which from superstitious fear or hyper, hypocritic, hypocritical loathing of oneself, goes to work with self-torture and mortification of the flesh, is not directed to virtue, he says, but rather to fantastically, fanatically, purging oneself of sin by imposing punishments on oneself. Instead of repenting sins with a view to improving, it wants to do penance by punishments chosen and inflicted on by oneself. So this kind of passage, where what's required by virtue is not self-harm, is not simply self-denial for its own sake, but a, uh, but a happy, and cheerful improvement of oneself, this could be straight out of Nietzsche. So there are passages here. So the answer to the question was, it's complicated. There are passages here where it looks like Kant really is all about self-denial, where morality is about, in, in particular, denying our empirical existence and our empirical desires. We should wish to be free of them completely. But there are these other passages where he seems to recognize our embodied nature and the important role for emotions and satisfaction of empirical desires for beings like us. He never thinks that that's the foundation of morality, but he thinks that that's uh, an aspect of it for you. Okay, so back to Nietzsche. Um, yeah, sorry, actually one more point. This is sort of more conceptual than simply talking about Kant. And that's this. There's something a little bit peculiar I want you to recognize in taking self-denial and self-sacrifice 
to be the highest 